Doing okay today? Okay, okay. Sometimes it's interesting being here with the lights. You can't see everybody, but as my eyes adjust, I can. Those are at least are in the room. It's hard to know, by the way, as a pastor here, your pastor, who's here, who's downstairs, who's there, who's online, who's not online. And uh, it is difficult. And so community is important, and we can say amen to that, right? Showing up, be it online, be it here in the room, matters because relationships matters. I don't know about you, but there is a different dynamic when I worship by myself and read scripture by myself, which is important, okay? There's a dynamic there that's important, but there's an also a dynamic that's important when we gather together, how we can gather together. We can say amen to that. So I encourage that. And we, again, will continue to look to how we can meet together during this time in various ways that we can. Well, we do know that we can meet around the Word, okay? And so today we are in part two of our series where we are turning to the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're starting this week in chapter 2. So we're starting with chapter 2, verse 1. There are notes available for you online. There's a notes available for you out in the foyer, the cafe. And I'm going to tell you from the get-go, this message is long. So long that we trimmed it up, cut, cut off the last point. I'm taking a, actually a little different angle than the notes that you have. But there are, there, we're going to go through this passage. And today in this passage... Um, Paul is defending and communicating and explaining who he is, his ministry, to those in Thessalonica. And today, when we look through this passage, I am primarily speaking to myself. Okay, And by the way, when I do prepare messages, I'm not preparing a message for you first. <laughs> I'm pay- preparing a message for me first, right? I need to preach to myself. And you want your preachers, your pastors to preach to themselves first, right? And then second, communicate that to those who are hearing. And today in particular, where this mes- message is aimed toward, is Paul is unpacking what he and his um, associates are doing, uh, aimed towards spiritual leaders, aimed towards pastors, aimed towards leaders in the church. And it is good in the timing of our congregation as we are discerning who God would have us lead us in as a church in this next season. God, what are you saying? Who are you putting together? How can we work together? It is appropriate in that regard, and it's appropriate as we get to know one another. Those who uh, previously attended no, um, Mosaic, I've got the uh, opportunity and privilege to know them. And as we are together, and it's only been a couple months that I'm looking forward and have now the privilege, and we have the privilege to get to know one another as well. So this um, passage is appropriate for us to look at, to understand. And I want you to understand, number one, that what you are to expect from spiritual leaders. Okay? Unfortunately... In our time frame, and unfortunately in um, Christianity throughout the ages, there has been spiritual leaders who have failed, right? And the bigger they are, right, when they fail, the harder they fall. And there have been people that I have looked up to in ministry and appreciated um, their ministry to me that in the passing of time, they have failed in um, um, remarkable ways. Just recently, one of the great apologists that we've had, and perhaps you're aware of this, uh, things have come to light, um, improprieties and, and, and um, what's the word, abuses, that's the right word, that break my heart, okay. and hopefully <laughs> break your heart as well. And so Paul gives us a road map as to what we are to do if you aspire towards spiritual leadership and what we are to expect of spiritual leaders. Now, I've been a pastor for 25, going on 26 or so years, and I've done a lot of pastoral training, and it's interesting for me to to notice as those on the top often will say, you need to run or organize your ministry, your church this way. 
And I think we, especially in contemporary American pastoral society and training, there has been more of a focus of pastor as CEO, chief officer, versus pastor as shepherd, pastor as, and we'll see today, as child, as mother, as father. And so that is not surprising to me, a little bit being more on the inside, understanding where pastors have been and spiritual leaders have been put up on pedestals and kind of stepped away from the interpersonal relationship with people. And in that distance offers corruption in which their souls crumble and Christianity gets a black eye. Okay? I am more concerned about the reputation of Christ in the world than I am about any reputation of any individual. And you can say amen to that, right? Because when we, as leaders, and when people who are known to be Christians, and granted, none of us are perfect, but we do want to be honest, we do want to be humble, we do want to be transparent. But when people fall, it is heartbreaking for that in individual, but it's their greater losses when people view, oh, that's really what the church is about. You know what I'm saying? Presenting one thing and really doing something shady over here. So God help us to have a focus, to have integrity. Okay? And recognizing that spiritual leadership is different than other leadership. Okay? Why? Number one, because God takes it serious. I recognize when I get behind a pulpit or even just talking to people because being a pastor isn't what I do, it's who I am, okay? There's a difference, right? I don't just check into the clock, right, and spiritual leaders, and you just don't check into the clock and do your thing and then check out. It's who you are expressed in what you do. And God holds spiritual leaders to a very high account. I recognize that I will give an account for what I speak from this word, from a pulpit, this pulpit, other pulpits. And you want your spiritual leaders to have a healthy fear of the Lord. And you say, amen, right there. So Paul and his associates Silas and Timothy at this point, as you can remember, were going on this, their missionary journeys as the gospel was emanating from the center point of Jerusalem and it was spreading out and spreading out and spreading out. So Paul and Silas and Timothy, those were with them, were going from city to city at this point explaining the gospel. And as they went, there was a variety of responses to this message that Jesus is the Christ. In some places, there was a great embrace of this message. And often, there was a resistance, and at some point, so much so, that they were beaten with rob, rods, or they were stoned and left for dead, or they were imprisoned, or they were run out of town, or all of these type of things. Right? So this ministry was not easy. This ministry was costly. And history tells us that each one of the disciples, the apostles, were martyred. Okay, this was, um, yeah, 11, okay. Or, in John's case, abandoned to an island of Patmos after being severely tortured. Each one of them paid a price for communicating and following Jesus as he called them forward. So there is a price to ministry and there is a price of being a Christian. Now when we go and we communicate the gospel, we talk about the glories of God, we talk about the benefits of Christ, we talk about what there is there and the power of the resurrection and what is yet to come and rightly so, but we have to understand that in order to gain life, we lose our life. 
Often, in particular, in American Christianity, we try to add Jesus into the pie chart of our existence, right? And just to add it to kind of supplement everything else that we do and everything else that we are. Like we sprinkle a little Jesus dust on our life to make everything better. Versus being Christ being our life and we die so that we can live. Him being the center of who we are and that we are made new and everything flows out from our relationship with him and he transforms the rest of who we are. This is biblical Christianity. This is the power of the Holy Spirit where we're the person that we once were but no longer as God transforms us into the image of his son. And so those who understand this message, it transforms the heart with deep conviction. And we saw that last week as the Thessalonians heard about this Christ being the Messiah and embraced it with deep conviction, even though there was great opposition. An opposition probably like you will not face. Okay? You will face some. You have faced some. And if you are truly a Christian, the gospel has cost you something. And Jesus always is worth that cost. And if you uh, uh, inspire or you aspire to be in spiritual leadership, that is a great thing, but understand what that is about and understand what that requires of you. So returning to our text now, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And we're going to go through up to verse 12, and I'm going to cut it off right there this morning. We'll just continue. That's one of the beauties of speaking in series. You can go to a point and stop and just pick it up next week. So here we go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> you yourselves know, dear brothers and dear sisters, that our visit, this is Paul talking, Paul and Timothy and Silas, that our visit to you was not a failure. Why wasn't it a failure? Because they were still in the faith. You know that it was not a failure, even though they had to leave prematurely. And you know how badly we had been treated at Philippi, the town just before where they were in Thessalonica, just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. So number one, ministry requires courageous perseverance. Unfortunately, often with modern day missionaries or modern day missions, in particular... (laughs) often from those of wealthy countries, which would include America, when it gets difficult, instead of persevering, we go back home. Paul was saying, now catch this, right? And put yourself in his shoes. You are traveling and going from town to town, and he gave up his life for Christianity. He was following Christ, and in following Christ, it brought him headlong into persecution. So you cannot tell me that if you're facing persecution, you're not doing God's will. Often the contrary is true. If you're facing opposition, it's because you're doing God's will. There is a prince in, 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 um, uh, there's a prince of the nations. We know ultimately God is sovereign. He is king, but there is an opposition to him. There is a leader of that. It's a spiritual being called the devil or called Satan or called the father of lies and an army of people who are against God. And because they are against God, they're against everything he stands for. And one of the things he stands for is the redemption of his creation. And 
because we are following him and, and we have his image, because the devil hates God and he sees the reflection of our face, his image, he hates you. And he does not want more image bearers to be transformed into this image who he comes against. And he comes against. And he comes against. The devil is not lazy. He is persistent. He is evil. Seen it first and for, foremost in the eyes of people who are literally possessed looking across the a room from me and seeing that's not them anymore. This is something else. We see it personally. We see it corporately. We see it working. He opposes this message because he hates this God because of his own pride, thinking he deserves praise. So there is opposition. So don't be surprised about opposition. And these men were facing opposition but they continued to boldly proclaim the message. So if you are facing opposition, continue to proclaim the message. You can say amen to that. What if, what if Paul and Silas said, you know what? My back really hurts. They beat me and it was bad. And that food in prison was the worst. Right? Forget this. I'm going back to Jerusalem to sit in my nice office. To write letters. What if he would have done that? What if the person who brought the gospel to you would have done that as well, saying, yeah, it's not really worth it? If you desire to be in ministry, if you desire to communicate the message of the gospel, you must persevere with courage. And yet, God gave us courage. Recognize where the courage came from. It's not, oh, you can do it. Come on, get out there, boy. It's in you. It's not in you. Thank you. It's in God. Because you can't. But he can You have not yet come to the end of yourself. You have not gone far enough yet. God, give us courage. God, I don't have it in me. God, I'm beaten. Help. And yet our God gave us courage to declare is good news to you boldly. Right? He didn't just say, well, they got really mad over there, but I better kind of tweak the message so these people don't have a riot. Uh, didn't soft serve it, didn't spin it, didn't make it more palatable. Spoke the truth boldly. Ministry requires courageous perseverance. Verse 3, he's saying to the Thessalonians and also instructing us, he says, so you can see we're not preaching with any deceit or impure motives <clears throat> or trickery. Ministry requires your motives. Everyone who preaches the gospel, everyone who has a microphone or a YouTube channel or a satellite TV program, not everyone has pure motives. This should not be a newsflash. Well, they have a Bible. We should listen to them. Yeah, but well, listen through the lens and the filter of the Bible. There are way too many charlatans that preach this word with unpure motives. Even Paul's talking about it 2,000 years ago. And now we have the application of the internet and of cable 
satellites. Or in the name of God, charlatans fleece the sheep. Preachers have great responsibility for the condition of any nation, including America. Why? Because if our uh, prominent pulpits, and we'll take the United States, are proclaiming a gospel that is false, the people believe a gospel is false, and then become false Christians, and become open to whatever moralistic perversion and give in to things that are not right and as goes the church as goes the nation that was a good amen spot too no hear me And this requires pure motives. How do you get pure motives? Well, you do that by being tested by fire. You do that by saying, God, will you try me? Will you test me? Right? I'm going to tell you this. I was a male long before I was a pastor. Okay? The prayer that I have and a prayer even for yourself should be, God, may I become less and you become more. God, will you and help me to kill any desire that is not honoring of you and to you. God, test me, try me, see if there's any wicked way in me. Refine me like silver. We should say the same thing. And Paul was saying, listen, I didn't come to you trying to get a, um, a bigger Twitter followership. I didn't come to you to get more Facebook likes. I didn't come for you, come here so that I can drive a Cadillac. I didn't come here because I wanted a bigger house. He says, I'm not trying to get money. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to do any of these things. God as my witness. So we need ministers with pure motives and you can pray for me you can pray for us you can pray for all of the spiritual people who are are spiritual people all of the preachers and proclaimers behind any pulpit god help them help us to have motives that are true that only and primarily focus in on god's glory and his work and the hearts of people and our world You can see we're not preaching with any deceit, impure motives, or trickery. Paul is saying, you see how I've lived. You see what we've done. You see what we're going. We're not trying to trick you. He goes on in verse 4. For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. So ministry requires approved messengers. And recognize that if you're proclaiming the good news, it's not your message. You're just the messenger. How dare any pastor, how dare myself to proclaim a message that's different than what's written and presented in this book? This is where we go astray. Where the messenger thinks they have the audacity and the gall to change the message. So that they now are the author, whereas Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Ministers that make up their own messengers, excuse me, their own messages are not messengers approved by God. How would you like it if you told your son or daughter, if you have children, hey, go tell, in my case, go tell mom what I'm saying. And what if they, instead of conveying what I wanted them to say, they made up their own message? What if I said, hey, tell mom that it's okay for the kids to go to the neighbor's house? And then what if they go over to mom and says, well, dad says he doesn't like you. And why don't you go to the neighbor's house? Right? 
That would be a problem. How dare they? And how dare anyone standing from a pulpit say a message that's contrary to the message? Right? Thank you. So anything that's spoken up here, put it through this filter. So I tell you to bring your Bible. Right? Do I always get it right? No, but believe me, I try. Listen when you're listening to something on the internet. Or if you're tuned in to a Christian, see what I'm doing here, Christian channel. Don't be gullible and think, well, they used a Bible verse, therefore it's God's message. They could have twisted it so bad that it does not resemble anything that God originally said. Why do you think I'm telling you to read this? I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to read it for your own benefit, but I'm telling you to read it for your own protection. Ministry requires approved messengers. And being approved, you need to be tested. When you're tested, you go through difficulty. So that God says, yeah. Hmm. I trust him. God tests everyone he trusts. Come on, this is for me, this is for you. God tests everyone he trusts. You know, I'm no manufacturer, but I know some manufacturing techniques and Sunstrand or whatever it's called now, Collins Space or whatever, other places in town, Woodward Governor, these important pieces, they test them, 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 they test them. They test them. Why? Because if they fail, people's lives would perish on an airplane, on a vehicle, on a whatever, right? They test them so much that they say, oh, we can trust them. They put in all these stress tests. They say, yep, I trust this because it's been tested. Know that if you are going to proclaim the word of God, you will be tested so that you can be trusted. This is why when we pick spiritual leaders, we pick people who have been tried and tested. The scripture says, test them, be, um, don't be, what's the word, hasty in laying on hands of people. Just give it some time. See who they are, see what they do when they're tested and they're tried. And if they are, you can be trusted. Ministry requires <coughs> approved messengers. And Paul was saying, this is who we are. Paul was saying, hey, we persevered with uh, uh, courage. You've seen what we've done. We continue to communicate boldly. Hey, you understand that we're not here trying to get something from you. Hey, by the way, we are been approved by God, and so saying that we look to spiritual leaders, we should expect the same thing. If that's your uh, aspiration, you should expect to go through stuff like this. Now he goes on. <clears throat> and I really like this. This is aim for the goal of ministry. The aim, the aim of the goal of ministry, or aim for the goal of ministry. This is the goal of ministry. Here we go. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. Second half of that verse up to 6. He goes, now our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. Never once did we try to win you with flattery, as you well know. And God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. Glad you laughed. It's a good translation. As we, as for human praise, we have never sought it from you or anyone else. 
purpose of ministry is to please God. Now, we as ministers can make it something else. We think the purpose sometimes of ministry is to have a big church. We think the purpose of ministry is to feed the poor. We think the purpose of ministry is to create social justice or eliminate poverty, fill in the blank or have a moral standard or on and on and on and on and on. Now, all of those things may be a means to an end, but they're not an end in itself. The end goal of ministry and of our lives is to please God. And if it's going to be pleasing to God, that's, we feed the poor, let's feed the poor. If it's pleasing to God that we combat injustice, and we do that. But those things are done so that God is pleased. Not that a crowd is drawn. And that is a temptation of every pastor. Including this one. You want to keep a congregation together or you want people to come. So you flatter them telling them how great they are. Telling people that they're sinners is not a popular message. I want to hear how great I am. I want to hear how much I can do. I want four easy steps to a great life. Now I'm messing. Can you see how it gets perverted? Right? We're human. Feels better to have a full church than a half full church. Feels better to have other pastors say, wow. What are you doing over there? Just because someone has 300,000, 30,000 subscribers or people in their auditorium doesn't mean that they're pleasing God. Now, if you have three people, doesn't mean that you're pleasing God either. <laughs> So hear me. I'm not saying that small ministry means better. I'm just saying that we have to be aware that the ultimate goal of our life and the ultimate goal of ministry is to please God. And if that's the goal, right? People will be benefited, right? You don't want me to try to please you. You want me to try to please God, and so doing, you will be benefited. And you can say amen to that. Right? That's the ultimate goal. God, help us. And it's easy. You can see why the gospel message gets perverted into all other things. Because it's easier to try to flatter people, to keep them together, to keep them coming. Because you've got to keep the buzz. You've got to keep the popularity. You've got to keep the offerings up. You've got to do all this stuff. So you don't want to be too offensive. You don't want to be too, you know, whatever. Don't want to talk about homosexuality and how it's in. That's not this message, by the way. Aim for the goal of ministry, which is ultimately to please God and please pray for spiritual leaders who have fallen into this temptation of trying to flatter people because it doesn't please God nor does it benefit people. Ultimately, spiritually. So Paul says, listen, our purpose is to please God, not to flatter you. And you want preachers to challenge you. Help you. Help us. Thirdly, I'm going to end with this point. <clears throat> Three parts, of course, to a point. <laughs> Apply the model of ministry. 
This is the model of ministry. I want you to hear this, and this is what you are to expect from me. Other pastors in this place, Pastor Key, Pastor Solomon, other spiritual leaders, if you aspire, this is what you are to expect. This is the model of ministry. <clears throat> Check this out now. Verse 7. As apostles of Christ, right? The foundation stone or the highest office, so to speak. As apostles of Christ, Paul said we and his companions, we certainly had a right to make some demands of you. But instead, we were like children among you. Number one, minister like humble children. Paul could have came in as an apostle and he could have demanded some things from the people that they provide for him, that they listen to him, that they whatever. He says, we didn't come in as authoritative dictators. We didn't come in with our pomp and circumstance. We chose not to come in at this level. We chose to come in as humble children looking to you how that if from your lead, how we can follow, as in how we could help, as we can see, uh, as servants to you, what you need. As humble children. This is how Paul came in. Coming in to serve. I'm coming in low. I'm coming in to respond to you like a child to their parent in the sense of there's a connection, in the sense of there's humility, in the sense of there is servanthood. And again, deep humility. I don't have it all together. And those who know me can say, well, amen, brother. I don't. And I'm not going to try to trick you that I do. I don't. There's so much that I learned from you. There's so many godly people in here. Learn from each other. Come in humble. You need to expect that of me. This is how I want to minister. This is how I want to approach. This is what I try to do. I'm like a child. But then coupling with this childness, minister, we came, we're like children among you. He then uses another analogy. He talks about being like a child in ministry. Then he talks about being like a mother in ministry. And then he talks about being like a father in ministry. And I understand family more than I understand CEO. Okay. Even though I, I have a leadership master's degree, right? I understand what it's like to be a child and how you come in and how you look to and how you determine your course based upon those that you're with, okay? It's probably a good way to put it. I understand having a mother and I understand to my wife what that's like and he goes on and this is remarkable what he's saying, minister, like humble children and he goes on in verse, second part of verse B. He says, or, we were like a mother, feeding, nurturing, and caring for her own children. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our lives, too. Minister like caring mothers. Don't you love that imagery? <laughs> right? I've had pastor friends who, who um, uh, have embraced the uh, pastor as CEO model. And so they, you know, appear behind a pulpit and they go away and they never interact with the people. This is how we are not to minister. We were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. 
Moms will give their life for their offsprings. And we can say, amen, mom. Right? They draw their kids close, right? Feed them, care for them, look them in their eyes. Wipe the tears. Wipe their bottoms. <laughs> Tie their shoes. Listen to them. Read the story for the thousandth time. When they're tired and their kid is crying, what do moms do? They get up. Another time. Not only do they share and take care of them, but they share their lives. If you've had a good mom, you'll understand this. And if you are a mom, you understand this. And if you are a pastor or a spiritual leader, you have to understand this. Sharing our own lives. <laughs> Loving because we care. Listening to that story one more time. <laughs> Going to a game or going to someone's home or workplace because you care and you're sharing your life and opening your home and your heart. This is what you should expect your spiritual leaders that we would be like children, that we would be like mothers. Minister like a caring mother. And he goes on now talking about um, a dad. Minister like honorable fathers. And he's describing his ministry to them in these terms of a family. Verse 9, he says, don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day we toiled to earn a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preached God's good news to you. Now, they could have demanded that they got paid, but they didn't. Paul had the freedom. He wasn't married. He didn't have children. He preached during the day, and he made tents at night because that's what his craft was. He says, we came in. We worked hard right, among you. He says, you yourselves are your witness. You've seen us, and so is God, that we were devout. We were honest. We were faultless towards you, all of you believers. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. We pleaded with you, we encouraged you, we urged you to live, urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. Don't you like that? It's part of my job. No, that's wrong. It's part of my privilege. Part of our privilege. For he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. God called you to share in his kingdom and glory. You to do this. God called you to this. And he gives us leaders and he gives us his words to urge us into that to understand and we're here to communicate to work hard as a father to plead to encourage to urge right? to be devout to be honest to try to do this right towards all of the believers So this is what you to expect from your spiritual leaders. Or to expect from me and those who will and are leading us. And God, help us to be like children. God, help us to be like mothers. God, help us to be like fathers. So I'm concluding. And Rob and the group are going to come up. And I'm going to ask someone else to come up. So number one, 
I want you to be a person who reads the word. We say amen to that. For your own growth and your own protection. Okay, come on. Please. Begging you. And us who are growing, okay, we're all growing. Let's interact with one another. <laughs> like children. Like mothers who genuinely care. Fathers who are honorable. Pray for me, pray for us. We need prayer. Pray for pastors and leaders in our country. Do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite up uh, a friend of mine, and you're getting to know him. So Lee, why don't you come on up? This is Lee Eklov. <clears throat> he is new to our community, but he is not new to the gospel. He and his wife, Susan, have served as pastors. And there's missionaries, and there's pastors, and there are people here. His ministry now is um, to pastors and leaders. He speaks all over the place. He has written two excellent books that I recommend to you. Pastoral Graces, and it feels like home about being a pastor in two churches. That's what his calling is taught. Teaches at Trinity and at um, Denver Sem Seminary soon. And so God has graced us with people like him and others, right? And so um, we talked and said, hey, will you pray for me? Will you pray for us as a church, right? Will you pray for us? And I thought that would be an appropriate way to uh, end this, and then we'll conclude. So thank you for praying. Out of my way. <laughs> yeah. he, he gives me grief. He's like, hey, you know, they, they make paper versions of this, right? Or whatever. Yeah, I know. He has paper notes. <laughs> Number three. We love Pastor Dave. First heard him on, I think it was May 15th or 14th, when we were looking for a church online. I've been a pastor for 40 years. The last year for pastors, especially in America, has been the hardest year that any of them remember. I've read that 50 to 60 percent of American pastors are thinking about quitting because it's been so hard. And frankly, because the people have been so divisive within churches. It's been really hard. On top of that, on top of figuring out Zoom and how to deal with all the junk that we had to deal with this year, your pastor <clears throat> was called to bring together two really different congregations, which is hard, hard, hard and wonderful, and my great admiration to both congregations. We're new to both of, both of you. You who are from Temple Baptist, you are gutsy people, amazing people. I just commend you. I know that you are missing things that were once part of your church life. And you from Mosaic, with your freewheeling and happy uh, uh, spirit, which <laughs> is just the greatest. You coming into a new place and trying to figure this out, it's hard. So in light of what we've heard from scripture, I wanna pray. You know, I just mentioned how hard it is for the pastors in America. You happen to be part of a church that includes Burmese believers. It's incredibly difficult for Burmese pastors in Myanmar. Far worse. They really do have that persecution. And Pastor Key here and the immigrants here know of that in ways that we really don't. It's not easy. Please pray for your pastor. We all amen when he says, I'm here to please God. That's great. 
till you have something you want. Take it from me. <clears throat> you all would like him to please you once in a while. And it might not be bad, but still, it's really hard. And every pastor deals with fear. Fear. So how about we pray? As I pray, would you sort of echo from yourself my prayers for Pastor David, Pastor Solomon, Pastor Key, the other leaders of this church, these who are trying to figure out how to do this, how to shepherd this flock and this community. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, our pastor, as it were. Father, it is a privilege to have a pastor. The Bible doesn't know anything about Christians who don't have a church and who don't have a pastor. We need shepherds, and now I find myself in the place of needing a shepherd for me, and I'm grateful that you have led us here. I'm grateful for the gifts and calling upon Pastor Dave, Pastor Solomon, Pastor Key, for the leaders of, lay leaders of this church. I'm grateful for the people here who desire to be a good flock, who do not want to be divisive, who do not want to hold on tightly to what they once knew, but are willing to do a gutsy, hard new thing, Father, to make a new church in this place. So, Father, for these people, I pray that you would give them courageous perseverance. The hard part of persevering, Father, for these is not in the face of persecution. It's in the face of all these overwhelming details and people who have agendas from different political angles and who ache in different ways. It's just exhausting. So give them perseverance. Some of these leaders have met countless times over and over, many, many weeks, and they're just weary. Lord, bear them up. Give them strength. Test our motives, Father. Thank you for the gospel that you've given them, this treasure of scripture that is our anchor. We pray that Dave and the others would please God, that they would know what that is, because that's the hard part, is knowing what it is in any given situation with all the complexities, to know what it is to please God. It isn't always straightforward. So guide them forward. Teach them to be prayerful. I pray that these leaders who know a lot about leadership would know how to be like children to these, their brothers and sisters, to be little, to be kingdom-sized, small enough to go into the tight places of the kingdom. I pray, too, these beautiful images. I pray that they would be like caring mothers, nursing mothers, giving of their very lives to these folks who sit here before me in different rooms and different uh, living rooms and so forth, God, give them the heart of a mother. It's so much easier to be a leader than a mother. Help them with that. And then to have the heart of a father who can push, who can encourage, who can urge godliness, who are able to stand before one another with the confidence of a father and call them forward. Lord, so many people need fathers. Give them godly fathers in this church. Help these leaders, men or women, to be godly parents to this flock. Father, Thank you for this church. Thank you for this household of God, this family, now blended. They don't even know each other's names yet.
Help them with that. They can't even see each other's faces, Father. Help them with that. And make us one. Make us the household of God.